Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. If you don't know me, my name is Ray. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, if you were here last week or watching or listening, then you know that Bill indicated starting this morning, we're going to begin a new series on the church. And we do believe this is a very crucial series because the church is very key to fulfilling the will of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So this morning we're going to define the church and we're going to consider some additional insight as to why the church is so important. We'll consider who the church belongs to and why that is so important. And we'll consider the New Testament church and the pattern for our church today. And then finally, we're going to consider why commitment to the church is so vital. And then we'll give you a brief look at what we're going to be teaching in this series. So with that in mind, let's pray. Ask the Lord to direct our time. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your incredible love and faithfulness. Thank you for songs of praise and thanksgiving and worship. Thank you for our tech team and worship team. Lord, just thank you for the privilege of coming together and singing and lifting up your name and getting in your word. So we ask you, Lord, even now that you would help us in our hearts, in our minds to be prepared, Lord, to take hold of all that you have for us relating to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. If you do a quick online search for the definition of church, then obviously you'll find a lot of online dictionary definitions. Question is, is it accurate? The uh, Merriam-Webster first tells us that the church is a building for public and especially Christian worship. And then secondly, the dictionary tells us that the church is the clergy or officialdom of a religious body. And then finally, if you keep digging, you'll see that the church is defined as a body or organization of religious believers. Can we trust these definitions? How do we know which one's accurate? Can the church really be all of those things? Well, I hope we understand that there's really only one source that we should be looking to when it comes to defining and getting an understanding of the church, and that's the Word of God. And so the word translated church, it comes from two Greek words that together mean called out from the world for God. And that word is used throughout the New Testament to refer to all those who have been born again through faith in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, actually, the first time that the word appears, it's in in the New Testament. It's the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 18, when Jesus tells Peter, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, the rock that Jesus refers to is not Peter. It's the statement that Peter made in verse 16. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So this truth about Christ is the foundation of the church. These words of Christ, were they were a foretelling of what was about to happen when He would send His Holy Spirit to indwell those who would take hold of the truth of Christ so that they could begin the work that Christ had called them to do. I'd like us to take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at a lot of Scripture today. Verses 14 and 15. Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God 
the pillar and foundation of the truth. So here, Paul reminds us in his letter to Timothy that the church is God's family. It's a family. And I like this 84 in NIV translation because it refers to church as God's household. So when someone places their faith in Christ, they're immediately born into God's family. And in Paul's letter, he would go on to tell Timothy to treat the members of the local church as he would treat the members of his family. And Dan's going to spend some time next week talking about the church as a family. Now, Paul also writes that the church belongs to God, the only true God, the living God. And because the church is the assembly of the living God, guess what? God has a right to tell us how to govern His church because it's His. The church may be made up of individuals, people who were purchased with the blood of Christ, and people who should in return offer themselves offer to live their lives not for themselves, but for Christ, the one who died for them. So Christ should govern the church. He should govern our individual lives as members of His church. Let's take a look at Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 12 through 18. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the uh, image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. A lot of things about Christ here in this little passage. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth and all things spiritual. He existed before all things. He's the one who holds everything together. He rose from the grave, rescued us from the domain of uh, darkness. Through the blood of Christ, He forgives us of all of our sins. So Paul clearly lays it out here. The church belongs to him. He is the head of the church. No, it's not a priest. No, it's not a pastor. No, it's not a board of elders. It's not a committee. It belongs to him. He's the head. In Greek usage, the word head meant source and origin as well as leader, ruler. Honestly, the church would not exist if it were not for Jesus Christ. It's through Christ that the church has life through the power of His Holy Spirit. And if Christ is indeed the head of the church, then He should have supremacy in all that we are, all that we do. In teaching, in leading, in shepherding, fellowship, in corporate worship, in our life groups, our growth groups, in our meetings, in our outreach, all of it. He should have supremacy. And He has given us His Word, the Bible, as our guide. And we're going to be taking a close look at His Word throughout this series so that we can be sure that as a church, we're giving Him this supremacy that is His. All right, so let's go back to Paul's instruction to Timothy. 
The church is the body of Christ. It belongs to him alone. He is the head of the church. And Paul then says that the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. The local church is a place where the Bible, God's only truth, has complete authority. Complete authority. The Bible is the only infallible rule of faith and practice. And the Greek words rendered pillar and foundation refer to a bulwark or stay or protection. You see, the church is to preach the truth, uphold the truth, protect the truth, defend the truth. So in the local church, the gospel must be preached. Sin must be condemned. Worship is to be from the heart. Our teaching is to be biblical, not worldly. The church must take a stand against sin and worldliness. You see, the church doesn't exist to be popular in the eyes of the world. And if you didn't notice, it's becoming less and less popular in the eyes of the world. Let's consider what Paul tells the church, what he told the church in Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, referring to the church, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him... The whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So once again, we see that it is Christ who is the one who joins believers together into one body, one dwelling. Yes, there are many local church gatherings, There are many denominations, many non-denominations, but only one church, only one church. And the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, meaning Christ himself. God calls his church, too, to be holy, to be holy. And the only way to do that is if the church is preaching, teaching, and holding fast to the truth of the word of God. Now, I know we've already looked at quite a few scriptures. Before we continue our discussion about the church, I want to make sure we know what we've concluded so far, because we've talked about a lot. So the word church refers to all those who have placed their faith in Christ, been born again. Anyone who has received Christ is immediately, upon salvation, placed into the family of believers, Christ's body. The church belongs to Christ. He is the head. He's sovereign. He calls the shots. And Christ is the church's one supreme authority in all church leadership, gifting, order, discipline, worship, are appointed through his sovereignty as found in the scriptures. What is the church to do? Preach the truth. Uphold the truth, defend the truth, protect the truth. Never should a church water down the truth. Never. Never should a church compromise the truth. So now I want to take some time to discuss the inception of the church. But before I do, I thought it would be good to consider some Old Testament history and how it relates to the church. Now, we don't find the word church in the Old Testament, yet the same Greek word, ecclesia, translated as church in the New Testament, is also used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to translate the Hebrew term qualal, qualal. I can't even say the word properly, but it means assembly, assembly. It was used for Israel as they gathered together to appear before God, and it was referred to all of Israel 
in general. Now, the church did not, does not, and will never replace Israel. You need to understand that. God still has plans for Israel. But what I find significant in relation to our topic this morning is God's plan for Israel in the, New, in the uh, Old Testament. You see, like the New Testament church, Israel was to be separate from the rest of the world, just like the church is called to be separate from the world, in the world, but not of the world. They were to follow God's laws and not follow the evil ways of the wicked nations around them. Israel was to be an example, a light to the Gentile or unbelieving nations. And God's desire was and is that unbelieving people would see the truth and the light, initially through Israel, and turn to the one true living God. And in Genesis chapter 12, God had promised Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation, the Jewish nation. And the Jews would possess a land. The nation would be blessed above all other nations. And all other nations would ultimately be blessed through Israel. So the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith as announced in the gospel in advance to Abraham. In Christ, believers are counted righteous by faith in the same way that Abraham was considered righteous by faith. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, not just the Jews, not just the Gentiles, but all who will place their faith in in Christ Jesus. Now that's really kind of an amazing thing because throughout history there was hostility between Jew and Gentile. And Ephesians chapter 2 reminds us that Gentiles were excluded from citizenship in Israel. They were foreigners to the covenants of the promise They were without hope and without God in the world. And they were not too happy with the nation Israel. But reading Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, he goes on to remind the church in chapter 2, verses 13 through 19. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Now this enmity or hostility that Paul speaks of is it's actually a twofold thing. Hostility that existed between Jews and Gentiles and hostility that existed between sinners and God. And Paul here describes the greatest peace in history, reconciliation to God through Christ into one body in Christ. And you know, the Jews would have a very difficult lesson to understand and to take hold of after the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the coming of His Holy Spirit. You see, for centuries, the Jews had been different from the Gentiles in religion, 
in their dress, their diet, their laws. And for centuries, there was actually a wall in the Jewish temple that separated the court of the Gentiles from the rest of the temple areas. And when Christ died, the veil in the temple was literally torn in two. And the spiritual wall of separation was between God and man. It was also torn down, if you will. And because Jesus fulfilled the demands of the law in his perfect, righteous life, and by bearing the curse of the law in his sacrificial death, Jesus removed that legal barrier that separated Jew and Gentile. In Jesus Christ now, we are one, one body, one family. So in Christ, both Jew and Gentile are placed in that same body, the same church, all members of the same household. The only hostility that the church should experience today is the hostility of the uncircumcised or the unbelieving world toward the church. Not between, not between church members. You know, the, the uh, unbelieving nations, they, they hated Israel. And it's true. Those who refuse Christ today, they don't have much good to say about the church today. Many are quite hostile toward the church today. All right, so we've had a brief history of Israel. When we consider the inception of the church, I think it's pretty neat to also consider the fact that it was begun with the Jews. The church began on the day of Pentecost, some 50 days after the Passover when Jesus died and rose again. And the book of Acts, it details the beginning of the church, its miraculous spread through the power of the Holy Spirit. Ten days after Jesus ascended back into heaven, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon those believers there in Jerusalem who had waited, who had prayed. The same disciples who feared being identified with Jesus. Now they were suddenly empowered to boldly proclaim the gospel of the risen Savior. And thousands of Jews from all different regions were in Jerusalem for the feast of the Pentecost. They heard the gospel in their own dialect, their own language. And many believed and were saved and baptized. And when persecution broke out, the new church was scattered. And in that process... The gospel message went with them wherever they were scattered. And so as we indicated earlier, the start of the church involved the Jews in Jerusalem, but the church soon spread to Gentiles and Samaritans. Just a quick comment as we consider that Christ established the church initially through the believers. You know, earlier... We mentioned that both Jew and Gentile believers make up the new temple of God. I want to read from 1 Peter 2, verses 5 through 9, something we discover here about who we are. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. In the Old Testament, there was a priesthood. God's people had a priesthood that God had ordained for them. Only the Levitical high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies once a year into the presence of God to offer sacrifices for himself, for those of all of Israel, to make atonement for their sins. But today, we are all part of the priesthood. All of us. Each individual believer has the privilege 
of coming into the Holy of Holies, the presence of God. We don't come to God through any person on earth, but only through the one mediator, Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, it was a privilege in Old Testament times to serve as a priest. It was a privilege. It is a privilege for you and I to serve as a priest today, as priest, part of the priesthood. Whatever ministry we perform for His glory, it's a service to our God. And Peter mentions the privilege of offering spiritual sacrifices. We are to give ourselves to Christ, offering up the praise of our lips. We're to offer up our works of service, our finances, all is part of that spiritual sacrifice, all for the glory of Christ. We're to maintain our separated position from the world, not permitting it to conform us to its image, instead being transformed by the Word of God. Now, here's a good question. What is the church supposed to look like today? How do we know how to do church? Well, I'll be honest, God's Word doesn't give us a lot of details about how to conduct a corporate gathering. But Paul does spell out several things that the church is not to do in their corporate gatherings. I'm not going to talk about that this morning. But there are no specific instructions about how many songs to sing, whether or not to use musical instruments, how many people should be included on the music team, whether to use lighting, whether to live stream, how long the message should be, so don't complain. (laughs) What we do know from reading the New Testament is the church is to come together corporately and in smaller groups in people's homes. We see that going on in the New Testament. We do know that there are certain character requirements for pastors. We know that the church members are to not forsake the assembly or meeting together. We're to get together and encourage one another and build each other up. We know that the pastors are to equip the church so that the church can do works of service using their gifting. And we could go on and on. There's a lot of things like that that we see In the New Testament, the church is supposed to do and be. And there's no better example than the early church, the New Testament church. They exemplify what each member of the church family is to be. And that is committed, committed to the local church. Acts 2, 42 through 46 says this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Christians of the early church, they were not content to meet once a week for service as usual. They met daily. They cared for one another daily. They won souls daily. They searched the scriptures daily. They increased in number daily. I appreciate how pastor and Bible commentator Warren Wiersbe puts it. He said, their Christian faith was a day-to-day reality, not a -a once-a-week routine. They had received the Holy Spirit, and they were living as men and women filled with the Spirit. I want you to know that we pastors, we are thankful, so very thankful for this church family. We really are. We appreciate your loving commitment to the church and to one another. We need to pray 
that as we continue to be a light to the unbelieving world around us, that more and more people will turn to Christ and receive Him as their Lord and Savior and connect with us to grow up in their faith and to reach their own family and friends. We need to be praying for that. God's plan for you today is to be fulfilled in and through the church, not on your own. I appreciate a recent recent quote I just received in a a message from a good friend and pastor, Tim Borseth, in our church in Decorah, Iowa. He said, it takes a church to raise a Christian. And he's right. We are so, so thankful for the church. I am You know, for the last 45 years since I came to Christ, God has used the church, the pastors, the church members to help me grow up in my faith. You know, Jesus appointed 12 apostles, not one. They were never meant to go it alone. I could never have made it on my own. I hope you realize that you cannot either. So, That wraps it up for the next six weeks. We're going to to continue this series to discover what God has to say about the church. Here's a taste of what is to come. Next week, I I, I hope, I think, Dan's going to teach on the church as a body, a family, an army. Then we'll talk about what the Word has to say about dealing with division in the church. that shouldn't be there, but sometimes is there. We'll talk about how the church is supposed to be pure and how to deal with impurity, immorality in the church. We'll talk about church leadership and how it's a little different from leadership in the secular world. We'll talk about spiritual gifting in the church. And then finally, we'll talk about church mission. So pray with us that God would use this series. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the church. What a blessing it is, God, to have been placed into your body, all because of Jesus Christ, who gave his life a sacrifice for us. But we want to pray for those who might be listening or watching or here this morning that have not personally received the gift of eternal life. Would help them to see sin in their own life, to recognize the need to repent of it, to turn to you, the one true God, for salvation through Jesus Christ who died and rose again on their behalf. Lord, we ask your blessing on this series. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.